to come to the ship. It was absolutely amazing. I'm going to go back one slide and touch on something. That crisis management, when I talked about seconds and minutes, when you have to push things out an hour, you as the leadership need to be thinking about what's going to happen. The reality of it is crisis management is nothing more than the ability to act in the now while still thinking ahead. If you aren't asking yourself the question, what next, you aren't going to get there. So that's why it's critical for you to push that bubble out. That's why it was critical for me to push that bubble out of the one hour point. So what happens? I've got this hole in the sign. I've got these boats that I've made an arrangement to. And trust me, we had to get used to boats coming out to us that no longer represented a threat. The Yemenis on the other token though, they had to get used to a very angry, very agitated crew pointing 50 caliber machine guns, M60s, M79 grenade launchers, and every other weapon they could grab at them that were locked, loaded, safeties off pointed at them the entire way out. Training and discipline paid off. There were no errant shots at any of those boats, and that's how we would eventually get all the wounded off the ship. So what ends up going on? Once I knew that we had that situation well under control, I knew I needed to get to the central control station and find out what was going on. So I went down two decks into my cabin, grabbed a flashlight, knowing I was going to need it in a darkened ship. I went down two more decks and started walking toward the back end of the ship on the starboard side. But as I looked toward the back end of the ship, I got my first piece of good news. Because at the back end of the ship, I see lights on. If I've got lights on, I've got a generator running. If I have a generator running, I can get power to pumps, and that's going to allow me to save the ship. So I start walking, and when I get to the middle of the ship, that's where the mess line is. That's where the crew had lined up to start eating lunch. That's also where one of my three repair lockers is. Guess what? That one repair locker, it's jammed shut from the force of the explosion. There's no one there. I rounded the corner to take a look at what the mess line would look like. That's what a typical mess line looks like when the crew can line up and slide their trays and get food. What did I see instead? A wall of metal. I don't even think I can walk down the passageway because it is so blocked. So what did I do? I took two steps, walked through the door, went to my main medical treatment area. As I walked into medical, it's in the dark and there's no one around. So great, I don't have a medical treatment area, but I've got two little battle dressing stations at the forward and back end of the ship that I now have to use for treating the wounded. But there's a great design on ships like USS Cole. The back doors of medical open onto the mess decks. Why? Think about it. The tables are 24 inches wide, 48 to 60 inches long, perfect width and length to take a wounded satyr, lift them up, put them on a table, and do triage to save their lives. But as I open the door to go out onto the mess decks, what do I find? It's in the dark. There's shattered glass, shattered plates, knives, forks, spoons, trays, and food scattered everywhere, and no one is around. So what do I do? You take a deep breath, you take it all in. I walked over to the port side. When I get over there, you can clearly see this bent door. What's a little difficult to see in the picture is right before the door, the deck is bent up about 18 inches. And just past the door, the deck is bent up at a 60 degree angle. When the explosion had occurred, it had projected into the ship. What had happened? It tore what used to be the overheaded main engine room number one and the deck of the galley into four major pieces. One peeled up and cut off the port side of the ship. One slammed forward into my chief petty officer's mess, killing or wounding that mid-level layer of management for the ship. One slammed back into what used to be the mess line with the sailors there, crushing and killing several of them. And then another one peeled toward the starboard side of the ship, taking all of the galley equipment and the mess line and shoving it over toward the starboard side. So right there, the left side of the ship is completely cut off for damage control. But as I walk back into the mess decks itself, I see that I actually can walk up on toward the galley area. And when I do, this is what my galley should look like. But as I stood there, that's what the galley actually looked like. But I notice one thing. I can turn and takes two steps to the left. And when I do, I'm literally standing at the edge of the blast hole itself. There is nothing inside the ship for almost 25 feet. It is just this gaping open area. You can look down into what's left of number one engine room. You can see the water that has flooded the space. You can see the sunlight coming in from the side. And you can hear the water from the harbor lapping. But you can also smell fuel and lots of it. We estimated that the Yemeni kept pumping on the ship at that 2,000 gallon per minute rate for at least five to seven minutes after the blast. That coupled with the cracked fuel tanks over the next few days, we'd estimate that we would put almost 100,000 gallons of fuel spilling into Aden Harbor. Now, my apologies right up front, especially here in California. I know everybody's gone green, but I did not fill out a spill report. 
There are some things you just have to let go sometimes. But it is not what I smell that worries me. It's now what I hear. Because down in what's left of number one engine room, amongst all that fuel, you could hear it's the popping and the crackling of live electrical wires dipping in and out of all that fuel. So I'm thinking to myself, great, not only have I suffered a devastating explosion, now I'm going to have a major fire on my hands. So I immediately leave this area. I walk back through the darkened mess decks and step out in what is the lighted part of the ship when I came face to face with an earlier decision. When the blast occurred, the announcing system for the ship to tell the crew what to do was knocked offline and the battery backup failed. Because of a design flaw, no alarms on the ship worked, all the cables had been sheared so nobody could tell us where we were flooding, where there might be fire, where there was smoke. The crew had gathered up all their wounded shipmates and they had tried to get outside the ship. And what did the captain do? He looked and had seen those orange rafts and had told everyone get back inside. Only after everyone had been brought in back inside the ship that would, did one of the security team members come up to me and say, Captain, those rafts, those are ours. Look. And sure enough, as you look up and down the entire port side of the ship, all of our life rafts, the concussion from the explosion, had blown them out and that's what had landed in the waters. The two garbage charges that had been there, they had left. What had come out, following the same profile as the third garbage barge, came down the side of the ship with two guys in it. They even stood up and waved at the crew, came to the middle of the ship where the third garbage barge was supposed to stop, where the other one had been. It had been blown up. That's what had blown the hole in the side of the ship. But not knowing that, now I come face to face. I was worried about security. The crew had no triage area, so guess what? That back end of the ship, that back end passageway, there's all the wounded stacked up. Two and three sailors working on every one of their wounded shipmates trying to save their lives. And as I looked down, I would have given an eye tooth as commanding officer to bend down and talk to each and every one of my wounded. But I can't. They are not my number one priority. My number one priority has to be the ship. So I step amongst the wounded, rounded the corner, and I walk up into the central control station. As I walk in, it is a hurricane of activity. To my left, the chief engineer is working with their engineers. What's the status of the generator? How much spare power do we have? What pumps are pumping online? To my right is the executive officer working with the damage control system. Where's the damage and what are we doing to isolate it? That's when I made the smartest decision of my command tour. I kept my mouth shut. The last thing I needed to do was walk in and take charge of a situation. I had no idea what was going on. So instead, I just stood there and waited for a minute, watched the ebb and flow of communications, and I said, Chief Engineer, XO, will you two already tell me what we've got? They came together and briefed me on the status of the ship. On USS Cole, there's four men engineering spaces. Up forward, it's auxiliary machine room number one. That has our number one gas turbine generator that had been running, but had been knocked offline, and we didn't know how to restart it. Behind that, main engine room number one. That had my one Alpha and one Bravo gas turbine engines powered that starboard shaft that ran the entire length of the ship. Just behind that auxiliary machine room number two, that's where the shaft went through it and I had a series of pumps and an air conditioning unit. Right above that is the supply office where I kept all the spare parts for the ship and the documentation for the supply department. Right above that, but not labeled, is my reefer deck where I had my refrigerator, freezer, dry provision storm with about 60 days worth of food on it. And behind that, my largest engineering space, main engine room number two, Two Alpha, two Bravo gas turbine engines that powered the port shaft, as well as my number two generator. My only operating generator was number three, which is near the back end of the ship. Number one engine room had borne the brunt of the blast and had flooded immediately. Starting with auxiliary machine room number two, we had what's called progressive flooding. Ox two flooded. Then the supply office. Then the reefer decks. Cracks and bulkheads put water forward into Ox one and back into main two. Even though she knew the answer, Chief Engineer looked at me and asked a point-blank question. Captain, are we going to lose the ship? I looked at her, knowing these ships just like she did. I said, no, if all we've lost are these two sets of spaces, we're going to be fine. The tension level came down by an order of magnitude. The crew refocused their efforts, and we went about saving the ship. Once I knew that we were stable, though, to a point that we weren't going to immediately lose the ship, I needed to go do my next thing. Triage. I went up to the middle of the ship where I'd been previously, where that quarter deck watch team was. They'd cleared what was left of that podium out of the way, and as I get up there, my chief corpsman, who's like a physician's assistant, briefs me on the status of the wounded. Already, I have one, two, three sailors strapped into metal litters ready to be evacuated off the ship. But as I look over at the third letter, it is my senior chief gas turbine technician. He's the senior most person in the engineering department. He lifts his head up, looks at me. 
motions me over with his hand. So I walk over to his litter and kneel down. He reaches up and grabs my hand. Looks at me and says, Captain, I don't think I'm going to make it. And I look down at him and I said, Senior Chief, I don't want to hear that. I want you to think of your wife, Lisa, and those two little blonde-haired kids here and want to see their daddy again. He said, but sir, I don't think you know how badly I'm hurt. Well, my Chief Corman had briefed me. He was the last Chief Petty Officer evacuated out of the Chief's mess. When they had found him, he was covered in debris and pinned down. He couldn't even move his right or his left arm. What he had done was he had reached into his pocket and pulled out a little flashlight and had been waving it around. When they got to him, he's perfectly calm. He says, I'm fine. I can't move because of the debris, but there's someone pinned on top of me. You need to take care of them first because they haven't moved since the blast hit. They said, Roger that, Senior Chief. So the rescue teams immediately started lifting all the debris off of him. But when they got down to him, it wasn't someone lying on top of him. It was his right leg lying up and across his left shoulder with a compound fracture to the femur. Those were the life-threatening injuries that we had that morning. So what did they do? They said, hey, Senior Chief, this may hurt a little bit. They straighten his leg out. Does he feel it? No. He's in shock. They strap him into the litter, bring him up, put that nice little M on him for morphine, give him a shot. Didn't make it so he didn't feel the pain, but certainly so he didn't care as much about it. And I just looked at him and said, Senior Chief, all you got is a badly busted leg. You're going to do just fine. You're not even the number one priority to get off the ship. Just to jump ahead, he would survive, promote to Master Chief, and I would do his retirement ceremony up in Elk River, Minnesota in January of 2009. Let me tell you, Minnesota in January is not sunny San Diego in May. So here we are back on the ship. How do I get the wounded off? We had to lean a wooden extension ladder against the ship at a 45 degree angle and literally tip the litters over the side with ropes and lower them down to the Yemeni fuel workers to get them to the boats that had come out to us. My chief boatsman, mate, despite being wounded, is working to get a, a game plank that you can see in the back end of this picture off the back end of the ship, but it was going to take well over an hour to do that. At the 30 minute point, and by the way, that's where we are right now, 30 minutes into this, my navigator is suddenly standing in front of me says, Captain, we're sending people ashore. We don't know which hospital they're going to. We don't know what their condition is or how they're, how they're going to be treated. I recommend we send someone ashore to take care of them. I said, now that's a great idea. Who do you recommend? He said, sir, I'll volunteer to go. I said, great. As soon as the brow's down, you go. A little over an hour later, she would walk down that brow, not knowing what she was going to face, not knowing what the conditions were, not knowing if she might be risking her life to keep track of the crew. I'm going to jump ahead in the story a little bit. There's a story out there called Message to Garcia. When the Spanish-American War broke out, the President of the United States, McKinley, said, I need to get a message to General Garcia, who's head of the insurgent forces down off Cuba. Who can get me this message to him? They said, sir, we know a person that can do that. He said, bring him to me. He handed him and said, get this message to Garcia. That individual took that message, four days later came ashore in Cuba, Three weeks later, came out on the other side of the island, handed the message to General Garcia that allowed us to coordinate his insurgent forces with our armed forces that would allow us to defeat the Spanish-American War. My navigator walked off that ship, tracked the people in the hospitals that resulted in us even sending 20 blood donors ashore to give blood for the wounded. That night, the first people to truly come to our aid, the French would fly a medical evacuation aircraft with a team of doctors into Aden. They would gather up 11 of the most seriously wounded with the navigator and fly them across the strait to Djibouti where they'd be treated. The next day the Air Force would fly two medical evacuation aircraft into the region where they would take out all of the wounded sailors. To tell you how well the crew had done, that first day we had gotten 33 sailors off the ship. We did it in 99 minutes and of those 33, 32 would survive. Well navigator had walked off that ship not knowing what she was going to face into a foreign country, got an air, on an aircraft from another country, flew to Djibouti with them into a third foreign country, could have left with the Air Force and come home. She didn't do that. What did she do instead? Coordinated with the embassy in Djibouti, flew back into Aden, checked in with the Admiral at the hotel downtown, made her way down to the pier, got on a boat, walked across the refueling pier, up the brow, and three days after she left, reported back aboard for duty. That's the level of dedication I had in my life. Well, that's all going on at the one hour point. 
the defense attache, an Army Lieutenant Colonel is standing down on the pier and he says, have you told 5th Fleet what's going on up in Bahrain? I said, no, we have no communications, no power. He said, I've got a cell phone here, it's GSM capable, do you want me to toss it up? It has the number to the 5th Fleet Operations Center. I said, you bet. So he leans back and tosses this phone up to me. And as I'm watching it tumble through the air, with all this going on, I'm thinking to myself, Lippold, when you were in high school and at the Naval Academy, you played two sports, tennis and golf. <laughs> Either involved catch, and if there's one time in your life when you better not drop something, this is going to be it. So as I'm watching this phone come, I cup it, catch it, it does not get dropped. I flip it open, the number's already pre-dialed, I hit the send button. A few seconds later, ring, 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 ring. Fifth Fleet Command Center, duty officer speaking, may I help you? I said, yes, this is Commander Kirk Lippold, Commanding Officer USS Cole. I have an OPREP 3 Pinnacle Front Burner Report. I'll translate that. OPREP 3, that's an operational report anytime a Navy ship, aircraft, or submarine has a major incident like this, fire, flooding, or an explosion. Pinnacle, that's a self-determination by me that whatever I'm going to tell that duty officer is going to garner national-level press interest. Front burner, that's an attack on U.S. forces. So when I tell that duty officer I have an OPREP 3 Pinnacle front burner report, the first thing I get on the end of that phone is silence, and then the duty officer asks, Are you sure? <laughs> Yes, I'm sure. I've looked over the port side, I've seen that hole, I've seen my phenomenal crew all around me working to keep that ship afloat and save their shipmates, I'm sure. Twenty minutes later there would be a message that would leave Fifth Fleet Headquarters in Bahrain informing the world that a Navy ship in the port of Aden, Yemen had been attacked by terrorists and was in need of help. We would immediately begin systems restoration and continue to do that for the next day and a half. By Saturday afternoon, we had actually taken water and had lowered it out almost all the way out of auxiliary machine room number two. We were going to achieve a victory. We were going to gain a space back. But about 9 o'clock on Saturday night, the space started to reflood and we didn't know why. We even dropped another pump down there. By around 1.30 in the morning, we had given up the space. It had reflooded, and there was a lot going on. We were very concerned about the ship. We had been working for two and a half days to keep it afloat. We are the most modern 21st century destroyer afloat. And what were we using to keep ourselves from sinking? Modern 21st century wooden wedges and this waxy rope substance called oakum. This is the shaft coming from main engine room number one and auxiliary machine room number two right as it entered into main engine room number two. The seal around it had shattered and we had packed in all these wedges to stop the water from flowing in. If you look in the background, you can also see a wooden brace, bracing the bulkhead so that it doesn't collapse and flood the space. We couldn't afford the power to go to air conditioning units and the ventilation fans to circulate air in the ship, so where did the crew sleep? Anywhere there was a horizontal surface. We were out under the stars for the next few days because we couldn't sleep inside the ship. This is what the crew was having to endure. If you weren't standing a flooding watch, a security watch, or a roving watch around the ship, you were part of the group here that was trying to catch a few hours of sleep so that we could keep that ship afloat. Here we were sitting alongside the ship. By Saturday night, though, as I mentioned, things were getting a little bit dicey. At around 1.30, with Knox 2 having reflooded, the wedges were being pushed out again in main engine room number 2. I did not like what was happening. Call it captain's intuition. I told the executive officer, get the crew up. Wake everyone up and put them back at general quarters. I don't like what I'm seeing. About 15 minutes after we did that, Number three generator, my only operator gen operating generator, quit. I had three chances to restart it with high pressure air. Over the next four hours, I would go through one, two, three shots. And by six o'clock Sunday morning, the generator's not restarted. And to put it in Navy terms, we were sitting along by side the pier, hot, dark, and quiet, and sinking. My navigator, excuse me, my chief engineer in XO came up to me and said, Captain, we've got an idea. If we go in down to main engine number two, we think we can cut a hole in the side of the ship, put a pump down there, and help those flood water so we aren't going to lose main engine room number two. I said, go do it. If things can go from bad to worse in a crisis, they always will. They go down there, they clear away the insulation from the side of the ship, measure to make sure that they were going to make the cut above the water line, go to make the cut, the battery on the cutting torch is dead. Now I'm in real trouble. What do you do? You don't give up. I 
turned to the executive officer. I said, XO, call one of the ships offshore. Tell them to get the cutting torch in here. In the meantime, we've got over 200 able-bodied sailors. Find every single bucket you can. If we're going to use, if we have to, we will use a bucket brigade to save this ship. We lined the crew up, put them down in there, started using buckets for just a few minutes, and then the pump got brought, or the cutting torch got brought aboard, got everyone out of main engine room number two, made the cut on the side. When we did that, it held the water level steady. And then remember what I talked about, trusting and investing creating those conditions for people to think outside the box. One of my sailors came to me about 10 o'clock that morning as we're sitting there kind of catching our breath and wondering what's going on. And they said, Captain, we used to pressurize the air flask for the firefighting ensembles using high pressure air compressors, but we don't have power. But we've got two portable pumps. What if we took the two portable pumps, put them out on the flight deck, ran the hoses down to number three generator, and rather than filling a small air flask, we filled the air class to the generator instead. They said, great idea, go jury rig the fittings and make it happen. They went down there, pulled the gauge line off the flask, jury rigged the fittings, hooked those two pumps up to it, ran them for the next 14 hours, and five minutes after midnight, I had two shots of high pressure air, and on the very first one, number three generator restarted. Absolutely phenomenal work, and we were able to save the ship. We're sitting alongside the pier. As I mentioned, for that entire 17 days we're in port, We'd heard about this heavy lift ship, Blue Marlin, that was going to come to our rescue, though. But we knew we needed to get ready for it. There were a lot of preparations. But early on the morning of the 17th, of, or excuse me, the 29th of October, 17 days after the blast, four tugs would come out to USS Cole, attach themselves, and gently pull us off the pier. I was very concerned about how the ship was going to perform. What had we done? We put the ship back at general quarters, we had remanned the repair lockers, and then I had done one other thing. I wanted complete silence on the ship. I knew the crew was going to be able to hear how the ship was performing long before they would actually see it potentially breaking up and flooding. What happened is we gently got lifted off that pier. USS Cole, American built, saved by American sailors, held rock solid and was not falling apart. Once those tugs were out there, Once those tugs had pulled us into the middle of the harbor, though, they let go, and the lead one started to pull us out. That's where I turned to the executive officer, and I said, XO, play the first song. We had partially restored the announcing system on the ship, and we had a big stereo system that we used for picnics, and we were underway set up back on the flight deck. What was the first song we played? Star Spangled Banner. You bet. Oh. across that harbor so that the people in Aden, Yemen could hear that despite what had happened to us, we were going to leave with our head held high. As we're getting towed out of the harbor, as that song's finishing up just on the right side of this picture, you can see there's two small Yemeni Navy patrol boats. And as we start getting towed by that pier, what had those crew done? They had gotten into their full dress uniforms. They had come out on the pier. They came to attention. And as USS Cole got towed by, they saluted us and rendered honors. And what did we do? As professionals, we called attention to port and we returned honors to them. Once we were clear, said XO, play the second song. What did we play? Star Spangled Banner again. You bet. Second time though, Jimi Hendrix version. <laughs> Once that's finishing up, we're starting to round the corner to head out of the harbor. I turned to the XO and I said, XO, the crew's heard it. Let them play what they want. In that defining moment as commanding officer, I learned my most valuable lesson on just how much leash you should give the crew. <laughs> you can see them all grinning over here. The next song that comes out of there is not what this commanding officer is, what I would define as music. I turned to the XO wide-eyed for the first time in two and a half weeks. I got to use some sailor-like language as I turned to him and said, XO, what the is that? That is not music. That is, get that off there right now. Okay? He gets wide-eyed, tears out of the bridge to run back to the flight deck to shut it off. I'm convinced all he did was around the corner and wait. <laughs> Halfway through the song, he calls me up to the flight deck and says, Captain, um, do you want me to shut down the song? Do you want me to, what do you want me to do? I said, it's too late. Let it go. Let it play out. What did the crew decided to play? By a great American artist. His name is Kid Rock. And what was the song of his they chose?
American badass. <laughs> now, I'll tell you, you can say what you want about Kid Rock, his tattoos, his lifestyle, I don't care. He is a great American. When he learned that we had played his song as the very first one, he was so touched. He broke down in tears and several months later would come to Norfolk and play a benefit concert for the crew and families of USS Cole and raised almost $75,000 for the crew. <laughs>